Welcome to Death and Dying. Before we start talking about death and dying, we need to talk about loss. There are different types of loss and we will be affected by these in our own lives and our patients will be affected by these as well. First, we have actual loss. This is when we lose something of value to us. In this PowerPoint, we're gonna be discussing death, but that's not the only thing we can lose. People lose relationships, jobs, objects of sentimental value, etc. And that psychological loss of something or loss of a relationship can be just as hard, if not harder, than losing a person to death. The next type of loss we have is perceived loss. This is when we lose something of value to us, but others may not see it as a loss. This could be loss of body image, finances, loss of experiences, or loss of a job. To others, it may not seem like a big deal, but to the, the person, it's a huge loss. Maturation loss occurs due to the changes that come with aging and getting older. People grow up and they become siblings, so then they're no longer the only child. We lose our friends when we graduate high school, and we lose the freedom to do whatever we want when we become parents. Then we have situational loss. This is when we lose something due to an unpredictable event like a pandemic, a traumatic accident, or a natural disaster. It wasn't predicted, it wasn't planned, and this type of loss and death is what the majority of us are gonna deal with as nurses. People do not have time to process this loss and it's usually dramatic. Lastly, we have anticipatory loss. This is when we know the loss is gonna occur and we have time to plan for it acknowledge it and process the loss. This type of loss is interesting because people who have time to process a loss before it happens don't always act and behave the way that we would expect them to. People who have anticipatory loss, like if they lose their spouse to cancer, may have a new significant other within weeks or they may even be remarried within months of the death. We see it as odd but that person has processed this death for a long time before it actually occurred. So they've already processed those emotions well before the person died. Now let's talk about how people feel when they have a loss. We call these feelings grief and grief is something we as nurses will deal with all the time. Grief is not just for our patients. We will experience grief within our own lives and grief happens to us when we lose a patient. Grief can be anticipatory or it may not occur until we actually have a loss. How a person grieves is directly related to their culture, socionomical factors, developmental considerations, the cause of the loss, and even our religion and spirituality. Mourning is related to grief and how an individual, family, or group expresses the grief and the behaviors that surround their grief. Different religions have distinct mourning practices and some cultures do as well. Bereavement is the amount of time it takes for mourning to take place. Businesses give us three days of bereavement time when we go to a funeral, but we don't mourn a loss in three days. Mourning can take weeks, months, or even years depending on the loss. There's no set amount of time and everyone will mourn differently. And then there's dysfunctional grief. This is when the grief is abnormal or distorted. This type of grief usually occurs after a traumatic event or occurs when someone denies a loss and buries their feelings and dysfunctional grief can have some major complications physically and emotionally. If you've ever heard of someone turning to drugs or alcohol after a death, it's usually this type of grief. They don't know how to cope with the feelings, so they turn to something that's gonna numb that pain. I wanna say that there is no right way to cope and to grieve. We will all grieve in our own way and no one can tell us how to grieve or that we're doing it wrong. In fact, as nurses, part of our job should be to educate people that there is no right or wrong way and to really work to promote family cohesion when there might be arguments over how to react to a death. There are two main theorists that discuss death and dying and the stages of grief, and that's Engel and Kubler-Ross. Both of these theorists define the stages of grief and the feelings that people go through. Both of them are fairly similar. They both start with the initial shock and denial of the loss. They both end the same when the person experiencing the loss ultimately accepts the outcome. 
What happens during those two phases is a little bit different depending on which theorist you're looking at. However, both of these theorists agree on one thing. Grief is not a linear process. Grief does not go step by step like the bullet points listed on my slide. People can move in and out of these stages of grief over and over and over again before they actually accept the outcome. And sometimes people never accept the loss. They can never get over that death. As we transition into death and dying, I wanna talk about terminal illness. Terminal illness is an illness where we know death is expected within a limited period of time. This could be from cancer or heart failure or kidney failure or any number of diseases. We know that death is going to occur. We need to know that the terminal illness is gonna affect our patient and their family. The patient may not be ready to die and have things that they want and need to get done before they die. The family may not be ready for the person to die, or they may be ready. Sometimes people live with terminal illnesses for a long time and they suffer, and death seems like a blessing to ease their pain. This is when we think about quality of life. To live years is one thing, but to live those years well and pain-free is another. If the person does not have a good quality of life, they're in pain, they can't function, they may be bed bound, they may require a lot of care, they may not even be conscious, then we would say that they have a poor quality of life and we should start conversations um, about what we can do to improve the quality of life and the time that they have left. This comes in the form of advanced directives, palliative care and hospice care. Advanced directives are the legal way a person says who can make the decisions for them if they cannot, and we call that a power of attorney. Advanced directives also determine what medical treatments they do or do not want if they can't make the choice, how comfortable they want to be, how they want to be treated, and how they want their body cared for after they die. We can have orders for full code, meaning we do everything humanly possible to keep the body alive if it tries to die. We have do not resuscitate orders, which means don't do any life-saving treatments like CPR. We can have allow natural death orders, which are basically like a DNR. We can have comfort care or comfort measures where we just do things to keep the person pain-free and comfortable. If we have someone who is terminal, or they may not be terminal yet, but their quality of life may be poor, we can refer them to palliative care or hospice. Because America sees death as a medical failure and not as a natural process of life that it is, palliative care and hospice care can have a really bad reputation. To start, palliative care is not hospice care. Palliative care is managing the symptoms of a person whose quality of life is not the best it can be due to an illness. This can be symptom management like pain and shortness of breath, it can be spiritual or psychosocial care. We're doing what we need to do and what we can do to make them feel better while we manage their disease. This does not mean that we're trying to cure the disease with our treatments, but we're helping their symptoms. Palliative care also doesn't mean the person is dying. Anyone can need palliative care at some point during a serious illness and at any age. Hospice care is palliative care for a terminally ill person. We know that death is going to occur and we do everything we can to make that person as comfortable as possible and provide support for the family. This can be symptom and pain management. It can be emotional support, like getting them to see their child graduate from high school or writing letters to their children or getting their bills and legal issues in order. And it can be getting the person all the supplies they need to be cared for and to die comfortably at home. Hospice care really treats the family as one unit and not just the patient. While we're caring for the patient, we're helping the family deal with that anticipatory grief they're feeling. And once the patient does die, we're helping them with the bereavement afterwards. The only way hospice works though, is that the patient and family accepts the impending death and is willing to allow it to occur. Sadly, in America, hospice has started way too late because most people cannot and will not accept the fact that their loved one is dying. All of the benefits of hospice are lost because of this. Now we're going to move into death and dying. The actual definition of death is an individual who has sustained either 
irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory functions, or irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, including the brain stem. There's a little bit more to this that you're gonna learn about in block four, but that's really an ICU level topic, so we're not gonna discuss it here in block one. When we care for a terminally ill patient, we're not doing things to prolong life. Our focus shifts to comfort and pain management. We don't do vital signs, we don't turn the patient or bathe the patient, or we may do all of that if they want us to. We don't usually give medications other than pain medications, and we feed them if they want to eat, and we stop feeding them if they don't want to eat. We focus on their wishes and what they want us to do and not do. Their wishes are our priority right now. And above all, we communicate. We listen to their stories. We help them manage their grief and loss. We help them mend relationships or end some. We discuss the death and dying process and what they're gonna go through and we listen. We don't give false reassurances. We don't lie to them and we work to provide the peace that they need. Many times we need to get spiritual care involved because dying patients can have spiritual distress when they're faced with their mortality, when they're told they're going to die. Dying brings out a lot of emotions and a lot of guilt and we need to help support them through these. We do all of this for the family as well. At a certain point in the dying process, the person isn't conscious anymore, so our focus shifts to the family and supporting the family. And some family members are in denial. They cannot and will not grasp the fact that the patient is dying. Our patients are not the only ones who can suffer from ineffective coping. Family members don't cope as well. This is a list of common symptoms that can occur when the body is starting to die. The person can get anxious and confused, anxiety from the knowledge that this is it, they're dying, or maybe from unresolved issues or things or paperwork. And some patients are just not ready to die. We need to sit with them, be with them, ask them what we can do to help them or what we can get for them. Make sure we speak to the provider about their code status. If they want to be a DNR, we need to get that order for them. Confusion can occur from the body not getting blood flow to the brain, and it can also be a side effect of the pain medication we're giving them to treat their pain. Dying is one time we do not worry about pain medication side effects. We are controlling their pain to allow them to die in comfort. It's a very hard mindset to get into and some nurses can never allow them to accept that the side effects of pain medications are okay and that they're not actually killing the patient. The body's dying, the pain medicine's not killing them. Pain medication can also cause fatigue and nausea and can affect the bowels. Constipation is very common during di dying but so is diarrhea and urinary and fecal incontinence can occur as well. The abdomen can get distended as well and the skin and mucous membranes get very dry as the body starts to eliminate excess fluid. The body wants to dry out before death. It is meant to dry out before death. This is why dying people stop drinking. We don't wanna give them fluids. We don't wanna give them IV fluids. And this is very hard for family members to understand. We want them to be dehydrated. This is how the body shuts down naturally. That also means that the amount of urine they're gonna produce is gonna decrease and will stop. These patients will stop eating and not eating is naturally occurring process during the dying process and it causes a lot of anxiety for family members. They want their family to eat or drink. It's the last thing that people can do that makes them seem alive. But unfortunately, if we let them eat and drink, it's only gonna make their symptoms worse. So we feed them and we let them drink if the person wants to. If they don't want to eat and drink and they're not hungry and thirsty, we don't feed them. Our patients are also going to start to have respiratory problems. Their breathing rate and the rhythm of their breathing changes. It starts to get irregular. They can breathe really fast or really slow, really deep or really shallow, and anywhere in between. And these patients also develop secretions in the back of their throats. Um, if the patient is um, comatose with the secretions, the patient doesn't know what's occurring, but it's very disturbing to the family members who can hear the secretions. The best way to manage the respiratory rate and the secretions is to let them be dehydrated. 
If they're dehydrated, their breathing is much better. Their, their lungs aren't filling full of fluid. Morphine is also a medication that helps with the breathing. When death is imminent, the symptoms they may have had get worse, stay the same, or they may change. When it comes to mentation, people who are actively dying can slip into a coma. They can get very restless or agitated, and sometimes they can have a moment of clarity and wakefulness that makes you wonder if they're actually going to die. If they do slip into a coma, they're gonna lose movement, sensation, and the reflexes. Their respiratory rate will get increasingly irregular, and they may start to have moments of apnea when they completely stop breathing, and then they may start breathing again. They can have gasping, almost fish-like breaths that are called agonal breaths, and this is a sign that the body is actively dying. The irregular breathing patterns they can have are called Shane Stokes breathing. The patient's blood pressure and pulse will start to decrease, but it's not uncommon for the heart rates and respiratory rates to get very fast right before the heart and the lungs fail. So they'll get really, really fast and then everything will slow way down. When the blood pressure, pulse, and respirations change like this, we know the body's dying. If there are DNR, there is nothing to do but make sure they're comfortable. We don't need to call the doctor to let them know that they're dying. If they're DNR, everyone knows they're dying. We're gonna allow nature to take its course. Unfortunately, as the blood pressure and pulse start to go lower, the skin becomes cool and clammy. The skin's gonna start to model, like these two pictures um, on the slide here. Modeling is when the blood is pooling in the dependent areas of the body. If your patient starts modeling, death is very close. Fingers, toes, and lips will turn cyanotic as the blood flow slows down and stops going to the periphery. Once the body dies, our focus shifts to providing comfort to the family. We allow them to have a little bit of time to say goodbye. We listen to their expressions of grief. We are a listening ear for them, and we help arrange funeral services. I don't mean we help them plan the funeral, but we give them names of funeral homes and let them choose where they're gonna send the body. We have to have a name of a funeral home before they can leave, so we know who to call to pick up the body. After this, we're gonna provide our post-mortem care. This usually includes removing all lines and tubes, washing the body, placing an identification tag on the body, and placing the body into a body bag. Sometimes we allow the family to come see the patient again before we place the patient in the actual body bag. Um, that part is very family specific and not every family member wants to come back in. Some family members want to help with the postmortem care and that's totally okay too. When we place the person in a body bag, we want to place them in it anatomically, meaning facing up, arms and legs straight, and sometimes we place a towel under the chin to help keep the mouth closed. All of this helps the funeral home prepare the body. If the patient requires an autopsy, the process can be very different. So I want you to refer to your, your facilities policies and procedures on autopsies because they can be different depending on where you work. The last thing we need to do after a patient dies is take care of ourselves. This is very hard to do when we're so busy as nurses. It's not uncommon for the next person to go into the room minutes after that body leaves. We have to mentally prepare ourselves to start caring for a next patient like nothing ever happened. And this is really hard. I want you to take five minutes to go to the bathroom and crying is okay. Get a drink, take a deep breath, reset your brain to continue on with the rest of your day. After you leave work, you may need to cry some more. You may need to take a walk and you may even need counseling. And all of this is okay. Death is not something we see every day, and every death we see becomes a part of us. Death changes us. It makes us harder and tougher and less emotional with repeated deaths. And this isn't always a good thing. We're humans. We have emotions, and we need to take care of ourselves so death doesn't negatively affect our health and well-being as well. And this is the end of Death and Dying.